Good evening, everybody. This is Kathy L. Murphy, the Pulp Book Queen, and I'm reporting here from Murphy's Law in the woods in East Texas. And today we have a very special guest. We have Mary Dees Hampton, who is an actress, and she has a book we're going to be talking about. But I got to tell you a little bit about Mary first, because the first time I met her, she walked into my shop with a bunch of her girlfriends. And they all joined my Pulpa Queens, and she joined the Pulpa Queens and has been in our book club for a long time. And so she's not only an actress, she's a Pulpa Queen. And I swear, when my book, The Pulpa Queens Tear Wearing Book Sharing Guide to Life, when it comes out in a movie, I want Mary Dees Hampton to play one of my <laughs> book club members because she is a book club member. So, <laughs> Producers, anybody out in Hollywood, if you're hearing this, this is who I really want. She understands this more than anybody because she's one of her own. So tonight we're here to talk about your husband who started out as an actor, became a film director, a pretty, pretty famous film director, James Hampton. I remember him as the bugler from F Troop because I love that show. I used to go to my grandparents and I used to think the only television shows that they played back in Kansas on their television was Westerns. And that was one of my favorite, but he has gone on to run with some of the biggest players in Hollywood. And now you have a new book and I want you to tell us all about it, Mary. Oh, well, first of all, thank you for that glorious introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I love you to bits. Um, and uh, we, we do go back a long way. Um, the book has been a long time coming. Um, Jim, as, as you mentioned, um, was, I mean, he was just a prolific actor in Hollywood. Uh, he started in... Um, uh, he actually was, started at Casa Manana up here in Fort Worth. Um, he did plays when he was at North Texas State College, which is now the University of North Texas. Uh, he was um, in the uh, special services when he was in the Army and uh, did plays over in Europe. Um, really? This is cool. And then came back here and uh, went up to New York and he was in a, an acting class with a young woman who uh, passed him a note one day and said, hey, are you interested in doing a little short subject film? Um, a guy I know is, is doing this little short subject film. So we went to see the fella and, and uh, he said, eh, you know, I already have somebody else in mind. And he said, well, uh, you know, I was an art major in, in college. You got somebody to build your sets. And the guy was doing this on a shoestring. And he said, no. And Jim said, well, I'll tell you what. If you'll let me have the lead, I'll build your sets. And, you know, he said, all right. That my little, kind of guy. My kind of guy. That little short subject film got nominated for an Academy Award the next year. And oh, I know. And so um, Jim was fielding uh, phone calls, et cetera, from all these agents in Hollywood. And Pat Boone had been Jim's pledge brother in college. <laughs> and so we called, he called Pat because Pat had been out in Hollywood for you know, several years at that point. And um, uh, he called Pat and, and, and he said, you know, I'm coming out for the Academy Awards. There's this, um, uh, uh, an agency out there, the Koner, the Koner agency. And, and are they, are they any good? And he said, Pat said to him, gee, I went to Koner brother for my agents. So he came out, it's a crazy story. He came out and back in the day, you know, um, the agents didn't represent like 500 people, you know, and, and so one of the Kona brothers picked him up at the airport, took him back to the office on Sunset Boulevard and walked in, introduced him to the other brother. And he looked at his wife and said, uh, isn't there an audition for Gunsmoke today uh, that, you, that Jim would be right for? Now, Gunsmoke was the number one show in the country. Yeah, the I watched Gunsmoke. <laughs> oh my and gosh. the other brother said, um, well, yes, I, be I believe there is. He said, well, jump in the car, Jim. Well, guys, just so he goes, he goes into the audition. Now he's still wearing his clothes from the airplane, you know? And so he goes in for the audition and, um, and, and, and he, and he books it. And, um, he said he was sitting there and, and he was listening to these other actors, uh, talk. And, and by that time, you know, Gunsmoke had been on like 15 years already. And, and he was listening to those actors talk and, and they were saying, well, how long have you been? I've been out here two years and I, oh I haven't gosh. had just my first audition. I've been out here for five years and I've really been, a, and somebody turned to Jim and said, how long have you been here? And he said, what time is it? <laughs> so, you know, that's a great story. And I well, bet it, you this whole book, 
I bet this whole book is chock full of those. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, you know, um, uh, it's just, it's, it's incredible, his career. And, and, you know, when you're destined to do something, how everything just falls into place. And so, I mean, what are the odds that you do this little, you know, short subject film with a director who actually, actually never directed anything else ever. And they found the original reels of that, of that short subject film. Somebody bought it in a garage sale in New York. Are you and kidding me? We got a call from the Academy about, I don't know, eight years ago, nine years ago. And the guy said, hey, we've got the original film. Somebody bought it in a garage sale and in New York, some house. And because nobody else in that film ever went on to do anything else. And so it, it's just incredible how his career just took off and, and the way it did. And, you know, he ended up doing three gun smokes, which again, you know, his first gig in Hollywood was the number one show in the country. And, um, and he just, you know, he really enjoyed it. And he worked with everybody. And there's a journalist named um, Gaddy Econ, uh, who said, uh, let me get this right. He said, James Hampton is one of the last living bridges between old Hollywood and new Hollywood. Because he's worked with yeah. Doris Day and Rock Hudson and Jack oh Lemmon, you know, all those folks. And then he's worked with uh, Michael J. Fox and uh, Jason Bateman and Billy Bob Thornton and and et cetera, et cetera. He directed uh, the last 12 years. Um, he was in L.A. Uh, before he moved out to Texas. And, um, you know, he directed people like, you know, the, the Maori twins who went on and had, they've got their own shows. And, um, of course, he directed Evening Shade. And yeah, all I love that and show. And I know Linda Bloodworth Tomlinson very oh, well. Yeah. So, oh yeah, Harry and, and and Jim writes about his relationship and how he got started directing was on Evening Shade and and it's just again the story of he said I think I was the oldest uh sitcom writer ever, you know, <laughs> at the age of 54, you know, but he was, um, he got a call from a casting director who uh, was casting a, an episode where they were, ca uh, uh, Burt's character, Burt Reynolds' character was going back to his high school reunion. And so Doug McClure, I'm sure you remember yeah, Doug I McClure. remember Doug McClure, blonde. And, uh, and Jimmy were cast at, as old schoolmates. Oh well, Jim used to write for Burt, you know, and, and they, you know, they were very, very good friends and they met on Gunsmoke. Um, Bert played a uh, Quint, the uh, the uh, blacksmith or something on the show. But um, so they had been friends all those years. And um, Jim began to, you know, to suggest a little here and a little there. And Mary Lou Henner went to Linda and Harry and said, hey, this guy knows how to write for the ages of the people that are on this show, you know, um, Ossie Davis and, and Bert and Charles Durning and, you know, oh, and uh, Liz, Liz Ashley. And because he, he was that age, you know? And so when you've got writers and, and no, no kidding, they were great writers, but when you've got 20 year old, 25 year old writers writing to 60 plus year old no. actors, it's the jokes are just not, you know what I mean? So, he became a writer on Evening Shade. And then um, when Harry and Linda got uh, uh, real involved in the Clinton campaign, yeah. uh, he walked up to Jim one day and said, Jim, you want to direct next week's show? And Jim's like, sure, you know, before he threw up on his shoes. But he did it. And then, <laughs> you know, and, and, and from there, he went on to sitcom Grace Under Fire and, and oh. Boston Common and all this Disney stuff. And so he's, he's had an amazing career, amazing career. Well, it's, and, and it's pretty all fun. in the book, and there's so many fun stories in there. If you, if there's a show that you ever loved, you know, uh, there's 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 six degrees of separation, you know, with with Jimmy Hampton. I mean, he did 32 episodes of the Tonight Show, so you know, it, it's uh, Johnny loved him, and and um, we had lunch with with Mr. Carson. Um, a few weeks before we left and moved back uh, to Texas, and that was my big thrill. That was my big thrill. I bet, because Johnny Carson, we all grew up on Johnny Carson. In fact, oh, I yeah. love that picture you shared with me of him and being on the show. I watched it religiously every night. I, I love Johnny Carson. But what I loved about uh, James Hampton is that he 
we can all relate to guys like him. We all knew somebody that was like him, just likable. I mean, but it's interesting that I didn't realize that he had come from Texas. You know, I just had Candy Clark on the show. It was mm -hmm. kind of a, mm -hmm. we had some internet issues, but Candy's from Fort Worth. I did mm -hmm. not know that. Mm -hmm. And now on that Academy Award short, do you remember the name of the title of the mm -hmm. show? Um, it was it was originally called The Cliff Dwellers. Um, and it the name changed to um, One Plus One. And it's now, you know, at the at the Motion Picture Academy, you can, I guess you can see it, it's archived there. Um, but it's it's a 15 minute short. It's a it's a boy boy meets girl. A boy actually boy sees girl from afar. Boy decides he's going to try to meet girl, and then and how that all happens. So it's very cute. Oh, that's a wonderful story. You know, uh, I've I always I read the book um, James Garner wrote uh, about yeah. his life, and I love that when he was in Maverick, and and you know he wasn't seeing the residuals that he thought, and he went you know, he went to court in Hollywood and he won. Mm -hmm. I thought that was famous, uh, uh, you know, something that I didn't know about him and the fact that he was an Oklahoma boy and, you know, I'm from Kansas. Uh, but I, what I love is their relationship too, because they played golf and did all kinds of things together. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. yeah. And that's, and um, Jim was actually a, a good friend of, um, of James Garner's brother, Jack, and they played, play golf as well. And, James Garner loved backgammon. He was a prolific backgammon really? player. And, and so they would play backgammon together as well. That's wild. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that is amazing to me, and this is why I always invest in my author's body of work, because when I first pick an author, like, say, Lisa Wingate, when she wrote Tending Roses, it took her 30 books until she wrote Before We Were Yours, which has now sold over 2 million copies. Mm -hmm. So I love to watch the trajectory of an, of an actor or an author and their body of work. And I, I love it when people invest in that. I cannot wait to read this book. So y'all, if you're listening, it's called, tell them the title is called what? And Give Up Show Business. And That's I'll tell right. you, where, can I tell you, do you have time for me to tell you where he got that yes, title? Absolutely. He wrote the title of the book before he ever wrote the book. And he said, I've got my title. And I'd say, I said, well, why are you going to, what, what if the book doesn't have, what does that mean? And he said he had seen this, um, this comic strip. And, and in the first frame, there's a circus that's coming to town. And, and the first frame is, is the ringmaster, and, and he's walking down the middle of Main Street, and all the people are on either side. And, and then come the, the acrobats, and they're doing their flip-flops and somersaults. And then comes the lion tamer, and the lions in the cage. And, and then come the elephants parading. And behind the elephants is, is this, this janitor. And he, he, he's sweeping up the, the <laughs> elephant poop. And, and someone on the sideline says, can't you, can't you get a better job than that? And the little janitor looks at him and says, what? And give up show business? And so that's, he, he, that's where he got the title. That's, it's a great title. And you showed me before we went on the air the size of this book. For um, those yeah. of you that are film buffs like me and love I mean, I watch everything from the very beginning movies. I love the movies from the 50s. In fact, in 60s, I've actually gone back and watched a bunch of James Garner and Doris Day and Gidget movies and everything. But can you show the book how big yeah, it is? It's huge. It's like, I would venture to say it's like a coffee table size book. It's got over 100 and I think it's got 162 pictures in it. Um, the majority of which are from Jim's own collection. So a lot of these you won't have seen, you know, elsewhere. But if, if you look at the book and here is my head. So if that, if <laughs> It's, it's, I and there's James on the cover, so you guys, if you you know this face, I know you know this face because he's he was in everything when I was uh, growing up. I just love it, love it. And, uh, and Jimmy, Jimmy's got uh, Johnny Carson introduced him one time. Um, he was he 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 didn't like to go back and and like prep his guests. Um, Johnny liked everything to be off the cuff. 
I do too. And, uh, but but he, he came back to the dressing room. Um, Jim was coming on and, and Jim laughs because Jim said, I always came on last. There was only one time I ever came on first, but he said, I always came on last. A lot of times the guests would run over and the producer would come back and go, eh, Jim, uh, we kind of ran out of time. Jim go, okay. And they pay him his $600 and he'd come back the next night, right? So he was having <laughs> um, But Johnny had came back and saw him one day in the dressing room and he said, hey, Jim, he said, I was, I was watching TV with my wife last night and he said, and she turned to me, she said, that guy, that guy, he's been on the show so many times. What's his name? Oh gosh, he's been in this and this and this, and this but what's his name? And so Johnny said that it kind of struck a chord with him because Jim had one of those faces that everybody knew his face, but nobody would remember his name. And so he said, I'm going to do something tonight, Jim, if it's okay with you. He said, I'm going to introduce you, but I'm not going to tell I'm not going to introduce you by your name. So Jim comes out from behind the curtain and Johnny says to the audience, he says, um, uh, this next actor, you will, you will recognize. He said, I want everybody who, who recognizes this actor to, to, you know, uh, stand up. Well, Jim comes out, he waves and we've got all this on video. It's incredible. Everybody stands up. Everybody stands up and uh, clap, 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 clap. And then uh, Johnny says, and everybody who knows this actor's name remains standing. Like everybody sat down except like two people. And um, <laughs> so Johnny made everybody put their hand over their heart and pledge to remember the name of James Hampton. Aww. And do you know that years and years and years later, Jim would run into people at the mall or he would run into people at a golf course or something. And they'd say, hey, I took the pledge. So that I thought that was really cool. But yeah. Oh, that was such a nice thing to do. That was a wonderful thing to do. Well, one of the films that I remember the most um, about him working on was Sling Blade. So tell a little bit about that because, you know, when you first think of James Hampton, I think of the Westerns and that. But mm -hmm. to think that he worked on that film, that's incredible because that was, it was one of my favorite movies that year, even though it kind of got, you know, pretty violent, but it was so, the actors were incredible. It was a, a so different of a film and I've, I just loved it. So tell, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, Jim at the time was directing Billy Bob Thornton in a sitcom that Harry and Linda um, had called um, Hearts of Fire with John Ritter and Marky Post. Mm -hmm. And um, Billy Bob had done a short subject film, a 15 minute film, um, that was quite different um, than, than the feature film was. And he came to Jim one day and said, Jimmy, he said, I, I've got a script that, I, that I'd like you to read. I, I've got the, um, uh, the backup to do uh, the feature. And I'd like for you to play the, uh, the, um, uh, the, I guess he was the, the superintendent of the uh, nervous hospital. And um, so he gave Jim the script and Jim said he went home, he put his feet up and read it. And he never put it down until he was finished. It was that good. And um, they shot it in 30 days That's for, a for a million bucks in Malvern, Arkansas and, uh, and the surrounding area. Oh. And um, uh, this, and this is a, this is an insider story, which like in the book, you're going to hear insider stories. Yeah. Um, so it was bought by Miramax for, I think, $7 million, and they shelved it, and they shelved it because they had another film that they were pushing, um, and there was so much buzz about Sling Blade that they released it only when they had to, and I think they have to release a film like two weeks before voting, okay, uh, for the Academy Awards. And the film that they were were really pushing was a film called The English Patient. Oh and, my gosh! And um, and and so they 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 shelved Little Sling Blade because it was getting so much buzz, um, and they were worried that the little million dollar film was going to you know boot their forty million dollar film you know to the curb. So. As it turns out, you know, I think uh, they did take home Best Picture, uh, The English Patient, but Billy Bob slayed it with everything else, and I, he won Best Screenplay. And Jim said that to his knowledge, they never changed one word of, wow. that, of that script, that it was that good. And, um, and he said, 
you know, he's just a, he's just a genius. He said, what's interesting is he said something to Jim that, that really resonates with me as well. He said, I, you know, he said, Jimmy, I would rather watch a small movie with a big story than a big movie with no story. Thank you. Thank you. This is exactly the kind of movies I like to watch. The story. Mm -hmm. It's all about the story. Special right. effects, mm, not that interested in. But right. I, I think that's why that film was so powerful, because it was such a great, and it was so well cast. I mean, yes. it was very well cast. And, and I, you know, I loved it. I Billy Bob Jones, people who had never acted before. He he wanted. I think he he's a guy who in in uh, in his early films, at least when he had some say so over casting. You know, he he liked to be surrounded by, as we all do. You know, people that we trust and and good people, and and that's what he did. And I think that makes. You know, as, as speaking for myself as an actor, you know, when you're on a set where everybody's comfortable mm -hmm. with each other, it, it, everybody's going to work better. You know, they just are, no matter what you're going to do, whether they're the lighting guy or an actor or, you know, the electrician, you're going to, you're going to be better at what you do if you're on a set where everybody's comfortable. Well, you're, you're quite the power couple. So what I'm dying to know is, first of all, how you got into acting and how you guys met. So what's the story? I mean, how did this all come about? Well, okay. So I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. I, you know, I, I was raised an only child. And so I was always center stage. And, um, you know, so I, I, it just, the stuff just came naturally. But actually, I was a, a political science pre-law major in college. I, I, yeah, so I, I didn't have any, I never took any acting or anything like that. I did, you know, voice and dance and, and things like that. But um, it wasn't until um, I was in my late 20s that I decided to take some acting classes. And um, I, uh, I moved out to L.A. Um, at 30. But like Jim, I always played a lot younger than I was. Well, and, you, you, yeah. I can see why. I mean, you're just but gorgeous. Not anymore. Uh, Stop. But, Stop. But, but anyway, um, so I was in class out there with a, a a young woman who was from Ohio. There's a lot of people from Ohio who are actors in LA. It's a very lot strange. of Kansans out there too. Let me tell you, I lived out there for five years. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, but she worked at this little dive country western bar in Burbank and this is when line dancing was really big <laughs> I, guess I was like all lonely and everything but she was like well why don't you come over because I lived in Burbank and she'd say why don't you come over and you know we have food and you know there's there's line dancing and they had this teeny little I mean the the size of the dance floor was the size of this desktop you know it's, it's a tiny little place I was like yeah no I you know I I, I don't drink and so um she called, she just kept asking me, she called one day when a friend of mine was visiting. I said, you know, this girl is so nice. Would you just run over there with me? And I went and Jim, who also doesn't drink, was there with a group learning to line dance. And <laughs> they, he, Laura introduced us and said, hey, he's from Texas. You're from Texas. Texas people meet. So they had this game in the bar that was like a trivia game. You paid like $5, you got this keyboard. And, um, and it was a trivia game. You're hooked up to all these other bars across the country and you would you would play this trivia game and I typed like really really fast and so we ended up we were the Texas Tornadoes Jim, Jim and I and everybody else was line dancing and drinking and we were doing this trivia game he's super smart Jimmy Hampton super smart and um uh so um we I think we were like number three in the country or something and Jim said that's because he knew everything that happened before 1975 and I knew everything that happened after 1975 so <laughs> I love it. So you met in California. Yeah, that's how we met. I had to go all the way to California to meet a Texas boy. And where are you from in Texas? Fort Worth. You're from Fort Worth. Is he from Fort Worth? Um, he actually was born in Oklahoma City okay. and came to Dallas, I think, when he was four. Um, and uh, started his acting career at Casa Manana, which that whole story is great, and it's in the book as well. Um, I am an Air Force brat and uh, came to Fort Worth when I was five and lived there until I went to L.A., so, yeah. Wow. Well, you've been, a, you were recently 
on the show, but for a totally different reason. You know, a little time back, we had Adriana Trigiani on, and she was talking about her film, Big Stone Gap. And I love that film, and you were in it. And I you was. played you played a wonderful character. You've played some very interesting. Tell us a little bit some about your acting roles. Uh, well, let's see. Um, I started out in LA. I did a lot of sitcom work. I did uh, several episodes of Family Matters and Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Uh, did a lot of infomercials, commercials. I was on General Hospital for a couple of years. I played Port Charles reporter Christy Coy. Um, Coy is in the fish. Um, and, um, and just, you know, worked out there, but um, moved back out here uh, in 2002 when Jim semi retired and um, did uh, Harold and Kumar, I was Harold's mother in the Harold and Kumar movies. Oh um, my gosh, I have forgotten all about that. Yeah. In fact, you know what? I was at a Pulpwood Queen convention when I got a call back on that Sunday morning. It was raining and everybody had their beautiful hats on and we were doing the gospel brunch that morning. Are and you I kidding me? Back. I'm not. I got a call back for the for that movie, and Jimmy, somebody else had driven because I was with my girlfriends, and and Jimmy had to drive to Jefferson, pick me up, and drive me to Shreveport for that audition. Are I you left. Kidding. That's crazy. Money. Um. So um. And then I I just worked. I I most recently um. Of course, I did Big Stone Gap. Um, I, I've done Bosch, uh, Wisdom of the Crowd, um, Lady Dynamite. Um, Lady Dynamite. Oh, my goodness. Um, I played a crazy Filipino bridal consultant. Um, but, um, but I just got through doing a recurring role on Claws on TNT. Um, and then also a, a role, which I hope will become a recurring role, on an Amazon Prime show called Vindication. Oh, and um, so we'll we'll see what happens with that. Now you were down in New Orleans when we did the last because you were doing it from a hotel room because you'd had to go down there and that was interesting because it was during COVID and yeah yeah explain yeah, how that worked me. because I don't even know how you did that. That's crazy. I, I, I mean it. You know you you you. But for the grace of God, go I. It was I had done an episode in January. January, right before Mardi Gras and New Orleans became the big hotbed. And uh, I was scheduled to come back in March, but then everything shut down. Um, got a call in September saying they were picking production back up, but I needed to come down and, and test um, and then quarantine. And then their production company had on-site testing every other day. And um, it very, very um, much a lockdown set. And, you know, I've worked, you know, I worked with Jimmy as his director's assistant for four years. So I was with him when he was directing a lot of those shows. Not, this was after he had done um, Evening Shade and, and like that. But when he was directing, uh, you know, a lot of other shows, I was his director's assistant. And so, you know, when you're, when you're working a show and, and let's say you're the, craft services person and it's slow you could just mosey on over to the sound stage and watch them not not anymore everybody you know is like you have your designated area nobody can touch anything like i mentioned craft services you you can't touch it you have to stand we had to stand six feet away point to what we wanted and then the craft service person would hand us the the coke or the you know whatever it is you when you came in in the morning they they tested they took your temperature you went to your your trailer and um you sat there um you went to hair and makeup which was the biggest concern i think for me because if you're getting hair and makeup done you know they're on your face but they were like double masks they had the mat the n95s and then they had the shield and um and then you had a shield you know and it was like a you know oh you know the the the, the shield for hairspray you know those shields yeah, that those they plastic clit see through yeah. yeah that's what we'd have when they weren't doing our face we'd have to hold that thing up so it was they were very 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 strict um you couldn't wander around i mean you left the sound stage you went right to your trailer and um and everybody was very respectful and um you know, it, it was, it was different. It was very different, but I'm blessed that, you know, I was able to work 
And um, the same thing. Most of us haven't been able to, so good for you. And uh, they, they, we actually, my role was shot on location um, in a, in a, in, in a shop. I can't say what kind of shop, but um, there was no one on the set when we were rolling, just the actors, the uh, the camera, um, they did it single camera, um, the boom operator and um, uh, uh, the director. And, and they were very careful as well. So, yeah. That is so crazy. Wow. Wow. So about where did you come into, when you married him, where did you come into his career? Where was he at? Um, he was directing. He was directing. He had just come off of Evening Shade and Hearts of Fire, and he was beginning to direct other sitcoms. And um, uh, he, he, Jimmy, you, uh, how do I put this? He, he, I'm a very detail oriented person. And that comes from my background of being a political science pre-law person, you know, and just being very detailed. Jimmy's not detailed. He's very creative, you know, so um, he needed somebody. Yeah. Since he was, since he would go, he was a visiting director. And since he would go from show to show, gosh, he couldn't remember the name of the stage manager. Oh gosh. Who was that producer? Oh gosh. What was that actor's name? You know, so he needed somebody like me, he said to, to keep him in line, you know, and I took copious notes because, you know, you, you're, you're directing and then all the suits have, have notes they want to give you and et cetera, et cetera. And he was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'd be writing them down. Um, so I came in when he was directing, but, uh, he, he did some acting, uh, obviously, you know, Big Stone Gap. He did a, a movie called, uh, Divine Access. He did a movie called The Association. Um, so he did a little bit of work. He did a little bit of work. Um, uh, but, but he was mostly retired and he was working on this book and, you know, um, it was hard because Jim told these stories a million times at dinner parties and, you know, at conventions and golf tournaments and, and like that, but he'd never like written them down. And, um, and so he, it, it just, he, he's like Margaret Mitchell. He wrote in pieces, you know? And so at the end of the day, it was kind of my job to put all this together. And Adri, Adri was incredible. She really helped. And she was, she was the push for him to actually do it. Well, you know? I'm so glad because so many, you know, these stories don't get written down and they're lost. They're mm -hmm. like a library lost for all of us that are into film. So mm -hmm. thank goodness we have this book coming up. You know, I, I encourage everybody to pre-order it because it'll be coming out. Of course, everything in the world has been turned upside down mm -hmm. since COVID, but uh, you're going to be featured at our 2021 Pulpwood Queen Girlfriend Weekend. It's our first virtual online. It's gonna be interesting, but we have so much going on. And just before I came onto the show, I posted the program. So you'll be able to see it on my page and then I'm gonna go back and individually send it to everybody that's being featured, but it's up. And I, I cannot tell you, I, I um, I am an idea person. So this is a very detail oriented person. So thank goodness I had Mandy Haynes who is working behind the scenes, an author helping me. And then Echo Garrett, who's uh, the publisher that I'm now working for as the director of acquisitions. She was doing a lot of the proofreading and helping me get it all together. You know, I don't think a program's ever perfect, but we do the best we can. And I'm really excited that you're gonna be one of the featured authors because I, to me, I'm a visual reader. So I love the movies. And my mother wanted to be an actress, so we grew up sitting on the divan, watching all these movies at night on our black and white TV. And I just fell in love with, uh, and I'm from that television generation. You know, mm -hmm. you talked about Linda and Harry Tomlinson, you know, back when I was in Jefferson, they came and stayed a week with me. Wow. Rock star bus. They parked in front of my shop. They stayed across the street, at the Excelsior Hotel when they were there. And we had the best time. I took them around to all my book clubs and they tried to take my kids back to Hollywood. 
<laughs> and I said, because they didn't have any children, they go, let us take Madeline Laney. They'd be perfect for them. I said, no. I said, I want my kids to grow up and have a normal life. And I haven't known too many children that um, became actors that, that, turned out very well. Mary Badham, I've met her, she, you know, who played Scout oh, to yeah. Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely, lovely person. And of course, Shirley Temple went on to do great, great things, but it's really hard on kids to grow up because they're growing up in front of America. So my mm -hmm. kids stayed home, though they did get into acting and uh, Lainey was in a few movies, but um, she's, uh, um, up in the North Dallas area, but what, uh, these connections of how, you know, people and then they know people and, and James knew everybody. I mean, he oh, really yeah. did. And so oh, no. do, you, do you know, Martin Giroux, the film director who worked on breakfast for Tiffany's, no. well, he had a radio program in Shreveport on, um, he, on stories of Hollywood. Now mm -hmm. he was, you know, he's passed away for some time. His wife was a decorator, Erin Joe, in Highland Park, and she mm -hmm. was a friend of mine. But I used to love to listen to his programs, and you know that, I'm so glad you got this all recorded in a book, because for people that are film fans like me, and there's a lot of people that have been watching a lot of movies, this COVID virus. Um, you're going to love this book. So please go online and you can order it now. It's what and give up show business. Yes. That's a perfect name. It is. It's great. Name. And I'm just so excited for you because this is a great book. And then someday you're going to have your own too, because you've got a story too. You've I did. Write it down. I do. I do. I've, I've got a, you know, and it's so funny because this book is, is full of so many wonderful stories, but there are still so many wonderful stories that are not in this book, you know, and, and I just couldn't, we just couldn't get them all in here. Um, but, uh, but, you know, yeah, there's more to come. Well, we're just going to have to feature, feature you periodically on this film club uh, uh, blog, because um, that's what everybody wants to know is the, the story behind the stories of films. Mm. And um, I just will probably, what I would like to do, what I would really like to do is when we have our annual girlfriend weekend, we do some screenings of mm. films too. We've done that before. We did it with, um, Mary Murphy did a documentary on um, uh, Harper Lee's, you know, to kill a mockingbird mm -hmm. story called Hey Boo. And she brought in all these wonderful people talking about how that book, for me, that's my favorite book of all time, but how that book was like a pivotal book for people. And it was for me, but you're gonna have those stories too, Mary. I, and I also wanna tell everybody, when you came to my shop many years ago with those girls, I remember you brought me a cake. I you did. That? You brought me a cake and I thought <laughs> nobody had ever done. I felt like a celebrity that day. I mean, you came all waltzing in and you had this cake, but that was, gosh, that was back in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, I don't know, 2000. I got to tell you something funny. I don't know if I've ever told you this before or not, but okay. I'm going to say this. This is, But this is just indicative of how fun Girlfriend Weekend is. And I know this is going to be virtual this year, and it's, but it's still going to be a lot of fun. But I have this friend, Carrie, who is in the book club, and, um, and she's from New Orleans. And, and Carrie, I think, I, I feel like Carrie has seen it all and done it all. And, you know, <laughs> she, I just love her. And so when we left that first convention that we all went to, when we left, we're walking down the street to the B&B. &B, and I turned to the girls and I said, well, what'd you think? And Carrie says, I feel like I've been to a cotillion at an insane asylum. <laughs> Somebody, they said, going to Girlfriend Weekend is like Mardi Gras meets, they, they said, I, you can't describe it unless you go. And I know Phil Duran came one year. He was a writer. He did everything from the Sanford and Son and the Wonder Years. And he came and it was the year I put him in charge of a skit we were going to do on a takeoff on the Oprah Winfrey show. It was called the Okra Show. 
and uh, River Jordan played me and I played okra. And he, he said, how are we going to do this? I go, all the authors, we're going to do the skit. We're going to improv. And he goes, we're going to do what? And he wrote, worked on Saturday Night Live and all this stuff. And he goes, he goes, Kathy Murphy, that's the dangest thing I've ever, I don't know how you pulled that off. And I said, well, because we all just like to have fun. And so I said, you're going to play this person. You're going to play, play this person. And we just worked out this skit and it was total improv. And he said, he went back and he said, I told my wife, he goes, I've been to every party in Hollywood, but I've never been anything, anything like the hairball. And I said, well, we just, you know, I just try to create the party that I most want to go to, you know, and it's with all my authors and my friends that love the story. It's all about the story. And that's what your book is. It's all about the story. And, you know, if we can bring all the arts into play, music, theater, you know, I even wrote um, a one act play for the Tennessee Williams Literary Festival called Oh, the Drama and Glamour. And I didn't win. And I just thought, you know, that's, well, a couple of my pulpit queens are actresses. And they said, well, let's put it on at Girlfriend Weekend. So we did. And so I pulled authors and they literally had no practice. They just walked on set, portrayed these characters with a script in hand and they nailed it. They nailed it. It was so much fun. So who knows? I may pull you one time, but I really do want you to be a book, one of the book club members when we finally get this film. I hope this vaccine comes soon and I cannot thank you enough for being on my show again. Let's, let's have you just periodically come back and tell us. stories. We'll do it again when the book actually when we find out really when it's going to release. But in the meantime, if you wanted to share one story from the book that you find, you know, I'm putting you on the spot here, but one yes. story from the book that just really touched you or held, you know, my agent calls it those aha moments mm -hmm. of things that just kind of come into place. You've mentioned a lot of them, but is there anything in particular that comes to mind? Oh my gosh. There's just, you know, there's just so much, but I, I'll leave you with a story. It's short. It, it, and it tells you so much of, of who Jim is as a person, okay. you know, he's, he's very funny, very down to earth. He's sweet as he can be. He is so sharp and so quick. And, um, and, and he tells a story about, he had just done, um, oh, maybe two weeks of, of F Troop. And um, he's sitting at home at the dinner table and the phone rings, he answers the phone and, and it's a lady from the Musicians Union. And, uh, and she says, uh, I'm from the Musicians Union. I understand you're playing a musical instrument. You must join the union. Now, Jim, having gone to uh, North Texas State, knew a lot of musicians. And he thought, ah, somebody's pulling my leg, you know, and, and she was not, you know, she was upset. And she said, oh, no. She said, you are putting a musician out of work and you must join the union. And Jim said, lady, you watch the show next Tuesday night. And if what I'm playing is music, I'll join. And he never heard from her again. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him! Wow, him. that's yeah, a great that's story. Cool. Well, that's yeah, crazy. There's, there's a lot of fun things in there, and and a lot of behind the scenes stories that I think people would really get a kick out of it. I mean, all of these stories uh, that he's got are upbeat and you know, and and funny and clever and and. Uh, things you don't know. And, oh, I have to mention this because it's really cool. Jim is a really good cook. And at Adriana Trajani's urging, she said, Jimmy, you have to include some of your favorite recipes. Oh, so cool. The book is, is also, um, you know, peppered with uh, some of Jimmy's favorite recipes. And, and so I think people oh. really love that too. What does he like to cook mostly? What type of food? Um, Jim is kind of the king of one pot wonders, you know, um, there's a dish that, and the recipe is in here that his grandmother used to make. And everybody, I think, uh, has a version of it, no matter where you're from, there's a version of it. It's, um, macaroni and, and ground beef and onion and some kind of tomato sauce and green peppers and cheese. And, and Jim's, um, uh, Jim calls it slumgullion. 
and, uh, and his grandma goulash is what we used to call it when i was a kid so so it's in there um but yeah there's all kinds you know there's there's all kinds of and he's named them after you know they go with some of his stories and there's a hilarious story i'm not going to tell it because you have to buy the book and it's hilarious but there's a recipe called um leslie nielsen's rootin tootin cowboy beans oh man Oh, so uh, that will be a good one. Well, that's yeah. a great, a great tease for all of us that are going to go, what? And you want to be in show business? So it's uh, the author is James Hampton, and this is his wife, Mary Dees Hampton, and they are both been in the film industry for some time. And we are thrilled that you joined us on our film club tonight. And what is the best way to get a hold of you, Mary, if somebody has a question? I'm going to, these are all being recorded, and they're going to be posted on my Kathy L. Murphy YouTube channel, which I'll share with you after it downloads. So if somebody wanted to get it, ask you a question or or ask james a question where would they what would be the best place to go in touch with me is is just to email me at okay. ma hampton at charter.net ma hampton at charter.net she's also on facebook too you all yeah, so right. thank you mary and we will you. see you soon because it's less than a month the girlfriend weekend I know. So, I know. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. And I'll be getting you the program within the next couple of days. So mm -hmm. God bless you. Say hi to James. And we just um, really appreciate you coming on the show. And so and Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Love you. Merry Christmas. Bye. Bye-bye.